Welcome to AI The Future of Us, a podcast-style video series that explores the ways AI is shaping our future and how we can prepare for the changes that lie ahead. I'm your host, Ferhat Takiner, and today we are joined by Bruno Aziza, who is Head of Data Analytics at Google Cloud. Thank you for being here today, Bruno. Thanks for having me, Ferhat. So I know that you speak to a lot of you know customers and you know you have been leading the data analytics at Google Cloud. But before we get there, could you share some of the key AI developments that you've witnessed during your career? Absolutely, you're right, uh, Farad. I spent a lot of time with customers, and I remember working uh, in this field a very, very long time ago in 2001. One of the business subjects, we were writing language recommendations as the, an output of a dashboard. So definitely. There's been tremendous amount of progress uh, since 2001. I mean, you could see technology like narrative science today, our great partners in ThoughtSpot, uh, and then, of course, all the development you've seen in Gen AI. You know, I think the main developments are around the same goals, right? And the four key goals to think about. The first one is increase efficiency and productivity. You want to use Gen AI to automate tasks. So you want to reduce costs, right, and save money on, on certain costs that are, you know, taking uh, time uh, away from your most valuable employees. You want to improve customer service. We see a lot of these uh, use cases. I know we'll talk about detailed use cases here. And then, then finally, you want to increase innovation. You know, these applications have the ability to generate new ideas. That is great companionship with information workers. Now, what's amazing, you know, over the last six months or so, you might have heard about examples like companies like Telus or Accenture, Wendy or Cartier. They're all innovating in this space. That is really exciting. I know we're going to talk about use cases, but just give you a, a specific example. Accenture, you know, a company I interviewed about uh, six or eight months ago about their Alice program. Alice stands for Accenture Legal Intelligent Contract, where they take over a million legal contracts and run it through uh, their artificial intelligence programs to translate the obligations that Accenture might have. So lawyers now can get to uh, you know, the, the bottom line a, a lot faster. You know, they've helped over 2,800 professionals globally to deliver faster uh, value to their customers with the use of AI. And so definitely we've gone a long way from 2001 when I was trying to get dashboard outputs in uh, human language uh, to my end users. And thank you, Bruno. And it is interesting to see where we have gone through, you know, within the changes in the ecosystem within the past two decades. And like so, Accenture and others, how they're really leveraging the technology that has been, you know, today as well. Now, I would like to focus a little bit on the, you know, some of the challenges or bridging the gap between the data analytics and machine learning, in a sense. And in your opinion, what are the main overlaps that you see for two traditional separate disciplines, data analytics and machine learning coming together? So I'd actually argue that these disciplines are not separate. They're highly correlated, right? When I was at Alpine Day Labs, this is an AI workbench company. We used to talk about GIGO, garbage in, garbage out, right? And the output of your models are highly predicated by the quality of the input, the input data, the quality of the data, but also the the data that you train your, your models on. So I know it's not a super sexy topic to talk about the quality of, of the data, but that is the foundation that most of these models stand on, right? I mean, it's great to have a great model, of course, but if the data is not reliable, um, you know, there isn't much that's coming out of it that's of uh, a lot of value. Now, this is not a new topic either. If you, if you Google the dimensions of data quality, you'll find, I think, a paper that goes back to 1991 from MIT, that talked about the 20 dimensions of, of data quality. Now, I'm not going to take you through all of them, but I will tell you if you're listening to us, there's probably three big questions that you should ask yourself, and they kind of spell this nice acronym RAT, RAT. One is, is your data reliable? Is it complete, fresh, rich, and secure? Is it actionable? Meaning, is it something that's relevant to the end users? Is it trustworthy? And is it timely? Can you understand it? Is it actionable? Does it get to you on time? And so the connection of high quality data that's relevant, actionable, timely, with strong models that are trained on data you can, tra you can trust is really how you're getting these two kind of uh, what looks like separate uh, topics or separate disciplines that gets them to come together. 
I agree with you, right? And your machine learning is really as good as your data as well. So you really need good quality data to be able to get, you know, good quality model out for at the end of the day. Uh, but, you know, and on the other side, what are the most pressing considerations surrounding AI development and use that you see as well? Yeah, there's, there's quite a few. I think, you know, the first thing is AI has been around for many years, right? I mean, we do have a ton of, of discussions around AI today, but we've used it for a, a very long time around us. And then the second, you know, the place where AI is most helpful is when it's supplied. So I would try to think about if you're uh, in the enterprise today, if you're a data leader, think about what your principles around how using Gen AI uh, should look like. Now, we have a great paper from uh, Anil, who's uh, the VP of data platforms at Walmart and sharing how he thinks about it. And if I were to summarize it, you know, it probably, again, would come to a, a simple acronym to remember. And, and one of my friends, uh, Andy Goodsman, actually helped me out with this acronym. It spells TARMAC. So how do you think about Gen AI? T is for trustable. And there are many dimensions of trust, right? So you got to think about privacy. You got to think about reliability, fidelity of the data, et cetera, fairness of the data. So T is a really important um, aspect. Then you got to think about the A, the applied aspects. Uh, it needs to be applied to the workflows, right? It's not very useful if you have a Gen AI application that is not integrated within the workflow. So it just takes you away from the action. R is for recency, right? So the ability to use data that's recent, not data that's happened five years ago, two years ago, you want data from yesterday is really important in making, helping you make the right decisions. M is multimodal. The best models will input, uh, of course, text, data, images, code, and will respond exactly the same way. So this idea of having multimodal applications is really important. And then C is contextual. What we're doing here for out, you know, we're having a conversation. You remember what I said before and we continue is an expectation of any GI application is that you need to make sure that it's staying with the context so you don't have to repeat yourself, which could be uh, a lot of frustration. So I know this might be a long acronym, so I'll make it simple for you. When I think about AI, AI stands for artificial intelligence, but also stands for applied, applied to the workflow, and in a way, invisible, right? Because it is contextual, because it feels like it's following you, in a way, you almost stop realizing that is a, is a Gen AI application. I like your acronyms, Brunan. I totally agree as well uh, in, in respect to, you know, it should be really unbiased as well, right? So it is as if how you train your child, you know, you want to give the, you know, most unbiased information and they'll really become that person, you know, going forward. But also we know that there are also challenges applying, you know, and using generative AI as well. You know, the we see lots of, you know, data analytics professionals also coming into and becoming part of this. And what are the main challenges that you see for, you know, the DA professionals in particular in terms of Gen AI? And also, do you think that we'll have data scientists, data engineers, data analysts, machine learning engineers, and you can just take the, you know, number of personas that we have. What roles do you think that they'll be playing in the future? Yeah, so I think it's a great question because it could be very confusing today. You're probably getting questions from your CIOs or chief data officers. If you're, if you're a data analytics professional today, you know, what are all the things I can do? And you know, I was just reading a paper by McKinsey that was showing the 22 use cases uh, for Gen AI applications. And I think I can get a little confusing because, you know, theoretically, there's an infinite amount of tasks you can think about. So what I would do is, if I were you, I'd think about this idea of jobs to be done. What are the verbs that you're trying to enable inside your organization where your Gen AI application can become a co-pilot of your work? And so there's probably eight verbs that I can come up with. I'm sure there's more, but I'll give you a sense of how they feel. First one is create, right? Your applications can help you create new content, and they can co-author new content uh, with you. Second is summarize, large body of text. It can fairly effectively summarize. You have to double check, of course. Don't just go with the summary, uh, just raw the way it's giving it to you. It can help you find better. It can help you review better. It can help you analyze better. It can help you explain better. Certainly in the case of business intelligence, you know, the, the use of natural language uh, can help 
you know, democratize the explanation of particular dashboards, reports that otherwise would have been fairly hard for uh, regular information uh, workers to understand. They help you recommend and they help you support. So those are kind of the eight verbs. I'm sure there's more. I'd love to see in comments what you all think, but think about that. Don't just think about the specific task. Think about the grouping of these tasks because then it helps you explain better to your management, the rest of the team, what is it that you're working towards. Well, I love your eight verbs, actually. So it, it looks like the, you know, the ecosystem will, will slightly change. It is not, it is going to be more evolving in a sense, right? And then with that, so what value does the Gen AI bring to organizations, you know, with, with your experience and, you know, I know that, as I mentioned at the beginning as well, you do work with lots and lots of customers and organizations. You know, where do you see the most value? Yeah, there's a, a few areas where, you know, as we said at the, at the beginning of, of this conversation, you know, the, the key values are around increasing efficiency, productivity, reducing cost, improving customer service, increasing innovation. I would say there's probably three key themes you got to think about as you think about the value vector uh, for Gen AI inside your, your company. You know, the first one that I would really think about is make sure you explain to the rest of the company, it's not magic, right? These models are pattern recognition at a massive scale, right? And so uh, it's possible because now we've access to all the plumbing that's required to make this happen. You know, we have, of course, the algorithm libraries, but we've got compute, we've got storage at scale that really enables you to do it, but it's not magic. So be sure to remind people of that. The second one is, it's not about machines versus humans. It's about humans with a machine that can do more than humans without a machine. And so it's really about co-piloting versus autopilot. And the reason for why I'm saying that is one of the things we're discovering is that with really good um, Gen AI applications, you can run into the risk of falling asleep at the wheel because you're starting to rely on it so much and become you know, it becomes so believable that you might, uh, how would I say, delegate almost too much to it. So you got to keep an eye on that where you're really using the technology to co-pilot and not autopilot. The one thing we've discovered watching people working with these applications is there's something interesting happening, this human type companionship that if you're using these applications, it's actually a great way to get feedback both ways. So if you're building content, for instance, you can talk to the chat as a way to get maybe additional information, refined content and so forth. So interestingly enough, when you would think that it's really an automated kind of relationship or transactional one, if you start interacting with it by giving it feedback and thinking about more as a sounding board to the ultimate content that you're creating, it could give you this companionship that sometimes is hard for content creators who are starting with a blank page and feel alone a little bit. These Gen AI applications actually can be very helpful to you. That's great. I think the you know what we can see is that the the AI is really becoming the assistance to you know different personas and different organizations and really helping us to become more productive to get to the you know the point that we really want to get to. But I, I, with that, I want to look you know look ahead and see what AI and business analytics really means and what do you believe is the most ex exciting potential for an AI application that we have yet to see with the data analytics in mind? There's a lot to be excited about, just that we talked about at the beginning of the conversation, right? It's around efficiency, productivity, reducing costs, improving customer service, increasing innovation potentials. Now, to be uh, you know, clear about this, you know, we're still experiencing a lot of, of innovation experimentation with it today. I think there was recent research that showed that only 4% of organizations are in production today. So we're certainly bound to find a lot of new use cases out there. But if I just think top of mind, I think the first idea around pouring through a lot of content um, more automatically, a lot faster so you can pick up the patterns, I think is where these applications are very helpful. So if you're a business analyst, for instance, you're launching a Gen AI application towards a large body of content that otherwise would have taken you a lot of time to go analyze is a, is a really key uh, use case. So you can see this across uh, multiple industries, right? You can see in, in healthcare, for instance, you know, where you can, you know, streamline the discovery of, of insights. Uh, you can improve uh, medical uh, imaging discovery and understanding. You can see this in the legal context as well. 
And so there are many, many areas where you can take advantage of this. There's also on the analysis side, you know, a topic we don't talk a lot about is the ability to create synthetic data as well as you're trying to test theories and so forth. And you want to not do this on personal data or data you don't have access to. These GNI applications can help you create completely uh, fake data that you can run uh, your experiments on. So that's another way to think about it, both in, you know, pouring through existing data that would be uh, a lot of time, a lot of work for you, but also creating data that you can work with as a way to experiment uh, your methodology and, and that would not expose private data or, or data that's highly protected. Those two examples are a really interesting one. There's hundreds of them across multiple industries, but certainly across banking, education, life science, manufacturing, healthcare, there are hundreds of use cases that I, I'm sure we're bound to uh, see a lot about and, and certainly see it deliver a lot of value to people listening to us today. I agree and we are really just seeing the you know tip of the iceberg. There's tons of you know use cases to to be identified. I really like your you know generating data really for different use cases because Gen AI as the name suggests allows you to create lots of data sets to experiment with as well. And and my last question around this and definitely not the least, so what advice would you give to individuals and businesses looking to prepare for the future whereby AI really plays a significant role. I'm hearing this a lot. I'm seeing a lot of articles. I'm talking a lot of customers, a lot of professionals. Everyone have this in mind, right? How I can prepare myself, how I can prepare my organization that I'm still, you know, valid, you know, uh, in the coming years and months as well. Well, the first thing I would say is that be careful about getting enamored by the marketing of many organizations are going to tell you to solve all your problems uh, with these new applications. I think you really got to study a little bit more uh, about the applications before you start applying them uh, in production and, and in real life. I think that's probably the first thing, like I said earlier, it's not magic. And the second is it is a co-pilot. It's not an autopilot. It is technology that can certainly be very helpful, but in the end, you're making the decision uh, and uh, you're needed to make the decision because uh, that's critical for how you're driving value into your business. And then finally, what I would say is get trained, experiment with as many tools, as many models as you can so you can see uh, how it feels. And remember that the quality of the data, the quality input, uh, the type of data you're training it on is as important, if not more important, as the model itself. And so you really want to spend a lot of time on the fundamentals. Those are not changing. You need to have high quality data. You need to connect your use cases to business value. And of course, if technology in the way between the data um, acquisition and the data activation, if there's you know, capabilities that can automate and facilitate your job, you should definitely consider them. But remember, you're in charge of uh, the decision in the end. Yes, and it is really an optimization problem at the end of the day, right? So whether you invest a lot of effort in building your models or whether you are using existing ones and high quality ones, how much accuracy is good for you and whether you are really getting the return on investment, you know, with the skills that you are providing and with the, you know, input that you are putting into as well. Thank you for joining us today, Bruno. It has been incredibly insightful to hear your thoughts you from your experiences as well. And we look forward to seeing how AI is going to continue the, you know, the data ecosystem around us. And hope our viewers will be inspired to embrace its potential and opportunities. Thank you very much. Thank you for that.